And they go, <laughs> they're both going to fail. Okay, I like that outlook. Um, and a lot of times that's what we get account held accountable to as PMs. Someone else made a lot, nice little schedule, probably to sell the client the project. When we're implementing it, we're like, oh my God, that can't happen. Relay that to the client and immediately we're a failure, right? So yeah, if we take that logic, it's wrong from when we start. Yeah. Which one do you think about it has a greater chance of, of succeeding? Yeah. So, so the balance, yeah, the balance PMs will, will, will do the top down and bottom up, the cost engineering and the analogous estimation. They'll go, all right, this is what it should take. Go to the client. Does that fit in with your budget and schedule? If not, let's cut things out. Let's fix things up. Let's add resources and so on. So the balance project manager sees both and says, let's do both. Those are just viewpoints of the extremes, the extremities. We probably don't know without all the information, but um, generally, a lot of issues we have from a purely scientific approach is the application of science to what we know people are going to go and mess up. Right? And one of the approaches, if you look at the technical scheduling tools and I'm sure you've done forecasting and so on, a lot of it's based on, on linear trends. A lot of it's based on, look, this is going to take us 800 hours to do. So eight hour days, it's going to take us 100 days to do. It works on that underlying assumption that People will work every day consistently. Right. Who here does? Who here works every single day, 100%? This session is being recorded, and I will relay this to your employers. 120. <laughs> Some days are awesome, and this is all that human performance, I'm sure you know about. Some days are awesome, other days we're not so good. So there are a lot of peaks and troughs in our performance. Um, a lot of studies point to these four as being the four predominant factors in the influence of human performance. Um, your motivation, your ability, your opportunity, and, and the direction you have for your project. And, and, and this, is actually, this is actually quite true. And I find myself assessing these criteria and when I look at my project team and say, oh, Bob's not really doing too much. So I look at it and say, is it Bob's direction? Is it Bob's motivation? Is it his ability? Or is it the opportunity, the processes, and so on? If you look at those, it's easy to cast blame and say, Bob's lazy. But if you look at those factors that influence Bob's performance, three out of the four are generally in my control as a PM. Okay? Um, the other thing is, I've made an error by assuming Bob's going to work 100% of the day effectively, because you guys have all validated that. A lot of organisations we work for do um, human performance indexing. So they'll say, look, schedule should take this long, we know that that is just the best case awesome schedule. So we'll apply the human performance index of 0.79 or how productive their workforce is. And that's all based on actuaries and, and numbers they have. If you don't have those numbers, 0.8 works really well. A lot of people just take that and they just increase their schedule by 20%. Um, but a lot of stuff with that is, you know, if you don't have the data, it becomes shit in, shit out. It becomes sort of a worthless exercise. Right. The other thing is they, what they do is they then take this schedule what it should take if people were optimal. And this is a lesson I, I learned from watching Mafia movies. And I think it should be applied to project management, but it's not really in many of the textbooks because it's maybe not transparent processes. Is I take this schedule, I communicate that to my project team. All right, guys, here's the due date. That's what we're working towards. I take this schedule and I give it to the person I'm accountable to. And I say, all right, look, we'll have it delivered on this date. There is logic behind this madness. It's not just trickery. A um, couple of principles of time management. Parkinson's law. Work will extract, expand or contract to fit the time available. All right. If I give you a task and I say, look, you've got six months to do it in, you'll get it done in six months. If I turn around and say, look, you've now got eight months, Rarely do people come back, you know, two months earlier and say, hey, I'll smash that out for you. The scientific explanation of Parkinson's law is student syndrome. All right. And this doesn't leave us when we leave university or school. When's the last time you did a tender or something that was due? Okay. And this says that two-thirds of the required work is performed within the last third of available time. 
<laughs> leading to this massive stress curve. This is important though, because without this, without a deadline, motivation tends to be quite diminished. All right. One of the things we do when we're trying to break down work really is have lots of deadlines and induce lots of little sustainable student syndromes, giving people some downtime after each one. Critical pass. And I think also by communicating the importance of the critical path to other people. Because a lot of people, they see this big diagram like this and they only look at stuff I need to do. Oh, it doesn't matter if I'm two days late on this part. And if you say, look, you are. That is part of our critical path. If you're late, Bob's team's late, this is late, this is late, and it directly affects our project schedule. Whereas you over here, you're not in the CP, you've got a couple of days where you can chill out, but you don't give them that. You keep your two sets of books. The other reason I like this model is because if you apply student syndrome, when they're up at this end of the, the curve, it's a stress curve. And a lot of us argue that we work better under pressure, we're, we're more productive and so on. Look, I say that to myself quite a lot. But I also know that I, I, I make a lot more errors here. So I make mistakes. So if you take this approach, you've actually got a buffer here where you can actually quality control, go through, review it, make sure it's all good. It's a bit of a tech, technical one because you don't want these guys to know that they've been busting their balls, pardon my French, to get to this point and you still had a bit of a room up your sleeve. So two sets of books works well. Hide one. Sorry? Look, I've... I know. I'd say I'm, I'm a very much student syndrome. You're the model student here, which had a prize. And um, at uni, week two, once had this student come to me and goes, look, I've got an issue with assessment two. I'm like, what is assessment two? Oh, the stuff that's due in week 14. Why are you working on it now? It's week two. Like, shouldn't you be, no, no, but like, I've got to this and question nine, I don't really understand it. It's the start of the, it's the, start of the semester. We go through that stuff along the way and then you'll get the stuff you need. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't happy with that response. Yeah. And for me, I was, I was, I was a tailor and I was a bad person, I'll admit it. I was here the night before, a friend would ring me up. Have you done that, that assignment? What assignment? The one that's due tomorrow? Yeah, no, but um, let, let's see what we can do now. <laughs> and it worked. That was the problem. I relied on the fact that I could do it. And I was like, this is easy. I'll just keep doing this. Bad habit. Right. So think of a number between 0 and 10. Nice practical activity. Okay? 0 is you've got no direction in your current job. Okay? Um, you occupy a chair, you keep it warm for eight hours or whatever you're prescribed to do, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't know what you're doing. Ten, you could communicate your project scope, outcomes implicitly. Five, you're somewhere in between. You got a number? Right, write the number down. We're going to get four numbers and we're going to multiply them together. So you may need your calculators or your, your very scientific brain. <coughs> and you keep that number sacred. Don't share it with anyone. Cool. Got your numbers? Yeah, what did you get? You're not meant to share it. It's a secret bit. <laughs> Jeez. All right, we'll move on. Motivation. I don't think I was direct enough. My direction was poor, wasn't it? Um, motivation. Um, 10. You would do your job even if you weren't getting paid. Let's go with that. That's 10 out of 10. You just rock up. You love it that much. You're passionate about your project. Some people are. Other people just laugh at it go, ooh, no. <laughs> You're the ooh, no. Oh, we won't admit it. Yeah, keep it to yourself. Um, zero, look, you're not even motivated to get out of bed, so you stayed at home today. You didn't go to work. All right, so nothing gets done, obviously. Five, you're somewhere in between. If they started cutting back, you would start cut back. Cool, zero to 10. Opportunity, this is the bureaucracy, the processes, waiting for approvals, waiting for things to occur before you can actually get your job done. Zero, you can't get anything done. The project hasn't got approval. 10, nothing's in your way. You smash out your work. And five, you've got a bit of red tape, a bit of bureaucracy. Either side of that, you can work it out. And um, this one I definitely won't get you to share in case you lied on your resume um, and you've got this job and your manager's in the room. Ability, zero. That was you lied on your resume. Okay? You've got no skills that you can really bring to the table. Charisma is a skill, so you don't even have charisma. All right? You're a zero on this one. 
10, look, no, no need for training or upskilling, you, you're pretty sweet. Five, somewhere in between, but the PD wouldn't go astray. All right, so you've got four numbers. Multiply them together, um, or you can just look at a small one and go, that's a bad one to fix it. In me, 10 numbers, sorry, four numbers, 10 was the biggest one. Obviously, I got 10,000 um, because I am just supremely awesome and it's a subjective self-assessment, so why not try and get some points on the board? Most people tend to find themselves, and this is pe these are people who are doing a, or perceive themselves to be doing a pretty decent job, somewhere between one to 3,000 in terms of human performance. I usually say to people, look at the smallest number, and that's what you should really try and improve. Right. The human response is normally we look at a number that's a seven or an eight, and we say, let's bring that to a 10. That two? Well, that three, now let's write that off. There's no way that's going to be solved. A lot easier to bring that to that three up. Okay? So for most people, you're around here somewhere. If you're below that, you might look at trying improving it. If you're above that, yeah, just bring your standards down. Otherwise, people will think you're, no. All right. So it's a good point. It's a good one to do with your project team to try and determine the reason why maybe things aren't going too well, maybe performance is, is lingering. And remember, three out of the four, you've got direct control. Motivation is a little bit harder because people are motivated by external factors. I, I, I take that. But go around the team and work out what motivates your project team. It's going to be different for everyone. And Einstein, the scientist that I quoted before, um, said that if you were to repeat something and expect a different result, that was his definition of insanity. When dealing with people, you're going to get a different result. All right? And a lot of people apply generic motivational tactics. So guys, we're all going to do a team building workshop. You're all going to get a pay rise. For some people, all they wanted was a pat on the back or something. And so that might patronise them, the fact they're getting more money. I know when I was working at a job getting a lot of money for something I felt that I was doing nothing to deserve, that was, that was bad. I had to leave. I just felt so guilty. All right? So people are weird. Other people go, this is my dream job. So there are going to be a couple of issues when we implement the project if we have a, a strong tendency to focus on one or the other. Um, the science stuff we've talked about um, is we might have a slow process and slow innovation curve on, on how to get there. Um, we can face issues when things aren't black and white, so when there's flexibility and creativity required. But in its defence, if we didn't have people, if we had automated systems, and I guess that's the way the world's migrating to, things would actually work out perfectly. Sorry? True. I've heard the, yeah, the computer has the ability to amplify all our errors, which it does. Actually, when I worked in IT, I actually noticed um, this is my own made-up trend, so I try not to offend anyone, and it doesn't have much scientific backing is I found this um, inverse correlation between my IT team. I found the more technically savvy they were, the worse their interpersonal skills were. And I found a couple of gold people in the middle who were you know, technically competent um, and also could communicate to the, to the layperson. But I found sometimes you know, that, that was my, my thing. So I actually broke them down and used them for specific functions. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that's validated in your, in your organisations or not. Um, pure arts, sorry, go through that very quickly. One of my biggest qualms, what I get really frustrated with, is when we start to lose functionality to make things look prettier. Right? I just can't deal with that. Um, for a lot of people, you know, architects can just put some earmuffs there. Um, that happens as part of their, their industry. Right? And, and that, that's a very much art space approach. <coughs> can we just play nice? Um, there's a video on here, I'm not going to play it because we've done too many videos. Um, and it goes for a bit longer. But if you get some time, YouTube a video called The Expert. And um, it's, it's quite a good one. It's, you can relate to it if you go to a lot of meetings where you've got technical people and project managers there. Um, I might actually just put on play when we all leave the room. Then if you want to watch it, you can, you can hang around. But it's actually quite a good one. Um, play it to your technical team. They'll love it. Cool. And that shows how sometimes they just can't coexist that well. So throwing it out there. Which do you think is more important to apply in your projects? An arts-based approach or a science-based approach? And you can talk about your, your areas, your disciplines, your, your people, your team, your management structure, the values of the organisation. 
What do you think has got the greater importance? You can talk about different aspects and different phases of the project if you want. What's in it for me? <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Anyone else? I think, like, especially if you look at our group, we might have technical specifications go to the design, mm -hmm. so they'll go to the letter, you know, to build the original pile and, you know, that bit. Yeah. But then the contractor who you've got working for you disagrees. So then you've got a sign versus a sign. Right, yeah. So then it's on the good and old. Yeah. And then they put very technical meantime the project director. You know, um, you're not at point A at this point in time, you still are in A, but you know, the, the technical specifications. So that's when you put me a little bit of art. Definitely, to sort of make them integrate. So you've got two technical people, two engineers. Yeah. You know, one works for company A and the other one works for company B, and they both disagree with each other. Perfect. Yeah. I've got a good case study for that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the outcome, not the process. Yeah. Cool. What I've found is, you know about hard projects and soft projects in project management, so... Normally a hard project, we infer, is going to be a, a very technical, process-driven project, very little flexibility. Soft projects become more creative. And often that's where you say, look, an arts approach might work better with the soft project because we do have that capacity for change and to influence the outcome, whereas a science base works better for that. One other model which I've seen is, is become quite popular is to sort of, and this sort of piggybacks off American football, is to have two teams, is to have your, um, your, your creative thinkers up here your artists, the ones who want to have change, they come in at the concept stage, they come in at the start of the project, they have that bigger picture thinking, that, that bigger, broader solution. They consult the end users, they make them part of the solution. It's a very, it's, the project's in a state of flux, as you can see. All the technical people probably see the dampened sign curve, and they go, oh, I love that thing. No, it's just me. Okay, I'm super nerdy, great, awesome. Um, they look at this and say it's going to be a very volatile stage. One minute we're doing this, one minute we're doing that, bang, bang, it's crazy. That's what these people are good at. They're good at the change, they're good at creative thinking. At some point you want to hit some you know, project normality because we know the cost of change in projects. Stuff's cheap here. As we start progressing, the cost of change goes up, benefits go down, value gets diminished. Cool with that. Then what they do is they bring on the science team to implement the project to seek the outcomes. Outcomes being determined by this team. Next team, they call them starters and finishers. I don't know if you heard that logic before. Next team comes in, finishes the project, drives it home, gets the results. I've, I've seen that work really well. And the reason why, if they just had the arts team all the way through, these changes would be forever being raised. OK, we're kind of bored now. Let's do something different. Okay. If you had the science people all the, all the way through, again, it might just mirror what you did last time. So. That approach, I know you don't have massive, infinite resources, but if you can identify different traits within your teams and sort of give them importance as based on that sort of thinking, I found that works really well. Probably another way to look at that is if you go back to your charts there, or in the concept phase, you wouldn't use your science people in the concept phase, you might use people with strategic thinking or you know, do a business case or office analysis <coughs> and try to have a team for delivery. 
Per yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Done. It's still important to have the input of the science guy. Um, one of the things we tend to do, which works really well, is have you guys used murder boards before? Murder boards? This is a good way to sort of enable both have input. We come with, um, let's say we're doing project, different project ideas or project selection, project A, B, C, D. And these could be dreamed up by a very creative, non-technical person. We then take it to a technical panel and we try and kill this. Technical people love this. Give me all the reasons why project A won't work. <coughs> blah, 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 blah. This is actually the best way to get um, to identify a lot of issues which are going to happen during delivery up here. And if you've got that stuff, people love saying why things won't work. So it's good. You can say, can we solve this? Yes or no? And it might be just, hey, we need to cut this project because you know, the technical team is correct. I find if you don't have something, you don't have to be specifically this exercise, I find if you don't have that sort of reality check at the start, the creative people will get you to do something that may not be actually possible or feasible. Um, yeah, I've talked to a couple of architects and I can't remember the last one, one of these guys wanted to have this massive light. It was a single light in a convention centre he was building. And um, he wanted it to be this solid light, probably the size of this room, just to go over their, their bar. And why not? Let's go and do it. And they put it out into commissioning and to try and get it done. And the um, structural engineers were going, the roof can't hold that shit. Like, why don't you just have like a perspex panel with the lights? No, no, we want the whole thing to be an illuminated structure, to be a light. And, and, and the project happened, but the costs budgeted versus actuals were just out of control. For the client, it still had value because they got their pretty light. For me, I was like, oh my God, there's so many other workarounds that if you did this, you could have shot it down and come up with something that actually worked for both. All right, case study. So now you've got to do work. Right? I know this wasn't part of the deal, but now you've got to do work. Have a think about this one. Um, so it's you, you're the project manager. This is very similar to the example that says sometimes you've just got to go and make the money and, and move on. Who's keen to, to finish this and just smash it out? Who's keen to just put on hold and just delay and listen to the engineers? One person. Just a little bit. All you want is more information, engineer. Come on. <laughs> All right, so we're launching, guys. Unanimous. Do you know what project this is taken from? Challenger. Challenger. Good call. Challenger Space Shuttle. So I lifted it straight from there. So the primary contractor for, for NASA said, one of the engineers said, hey, temperature's going to be this. This shit won't work. It's going to blow up. No, 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 no. It's right. Management was saying, look, if we don't do this on time, we lose a contract with NASA. <laughs> it was deemed as a small technical issue. It was, an, it was a small O-ring um, that actually was, was a cause for malfunction. If you think about a massive shuttle, 50 cent O-ring killed the whole. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. This, was, this was to trap you and to make you feel silly. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously you'd have more information surrounding this, but even with more information, management still said, let's do it. You know, let, let's, let's do it. Another one to make you feel silly. So this is an IT project um, that you're rolling out. You know it's not perfect, but um, look, you need to make coin. Industry's moving at a rapid race. If you look at the innovation curve in IT, it's pretty steep. So if we don't do anything about it, we could, you know, we could lose out on the race. If we roll with it, we've got a huge chance of getting sued by one of the, our competitors because we're copying their, um, their product. 
So who's going to release it? He's going to release it. He's game. He's, he's, he's got the gut. Yeah, that's his trailing mate. Should be right. Who's going to shelve it and just yeah, not risk their company? Who am I talking about? Close. Microsoft. This is their launch of Windows. Um, so I did a little bit of reading about this. It's quite interesting. Basically, um, Xerox came up with the whole Windows-based environment platform. Apple stole it. Then Microsoft stole it against Apple. And Apple said, hey, if you're going to have Windows that interface, we're going to sue you. So Microsoft went along with it and said, screw it, let's get sued. Took it to court and they actually won using the defense that Apple stole it from Xerox. So it was never their IP. <laughs> so if that hadn't happened, and even if you think about every iteration of Windows, it, they've gone out bug, you know, with bugs. And if they, there's an old saying, if they actually went through and perfected it before releasing it, we wouldn't have Windows. We wouldn't have many of the products we do now. So sometimes you do have to take that, let's do it and let's fix it. I guess no one's going to die in this situation. Although a lot of important things are run off um, Windows. So this is one I totally made up. So you're not getting tricked at all. Use your own brains. <coughs> all the facts are there. Didn't expect to be challenged. What do you reckon? Continue. Buy <laughs> one of the new ones. Reverse engineer it and fix. Or, or find what patents you've actually got the rights to and start looking down the legal and slowing them down. <laughs> Join them. Who would um, continue? I've got a couple down there. Why would you continue? The majority of people are continuing. Sorry. Okay, so look, we've spent nine. It's just an extra one with 10%. Let's just do it unless we've done it. Yeah? Okay, we've got something to show for it, yeah? <laughs> yeah, make it, make it sexier. So like, I think it's a Betamax versus VHS. Betamax is actually functionally better, but VHS just sold it better. So yeah, get the marketing team. I like that approach. Um, Big one was most people would actually continue based on, on two what we call cognitive biases, and I'll talk about that in a second. And one was sunk cost. So the more we've sunk into a project, the more we feel pulling the pin is going to be a waste. Gamble. Gamble. Sorry? Gamble is powerful. Exactly, yeah. Red's got to come up because I've lost so much on black, you know. I've, my luck's bound to change. But yes, yeah, so this is based on the sunk cost theory. And um, the other one is what we call self-justification. If it's our own baby, if it's our own thing, pulling the pin is basically publicising that we were wrong. Right? So most people would agree, although the pure scientists in you would say, look, this thing's going to be shit, we're not going to sell any because company B is up here and we're down here. Let's save the million and invest that in another project. Right? But we're not all just science-based people. So that's one cognitive bias. And I'll talk about a couple of them just very quickly to round off on. We all have them, they exist in us, they really influence a lot of things we do. What size coffee do you want? Big one or a small one? A lot of people are stuck right now. Oh, I don't want a big or a small one. I want a medium one. I actually did this once and one guy said, yeah, the cafe I went to, they stopped having medium sizes, so I left. And the large one was the same size as the old medium one, by the way, because I just left. All right. So, pick one. What do you want? All right. Has your decision changed? A lot of us, yes. A lot of us pick, pick the small one, and now this one comes up, and oh, now I want the nice, shiny, medium one. All right. um, we call this decoy theory. All right. And in getting proposals across, this actually works. You've got two, two proposals you're going to submit to a client. They won't make much coin, very little risk. They'll make buttloads of coin, but a large amount of risk. How they get this through management? They're going to pick one or the other. 
studies have shown that if you introduce the third variable, the middle ground, people will tend to, or, to congregate around that. Look, guys, we're not being too risky. We can justify this to the board. This would have been risky. All right? But this we can now justify because there's a risky alternative. And this somehow looks better. And we're still making a lot more money. So if you know this, you can actually, um, you know, we call it helicopter theory in negotiating. If you're negotiating, say, oh, I want a helicopter, I want all this. But really, your fallback's what you want. But by introducing that third variable, you can get people to see that as less risky and you know, a, a better solution. <coughs> this one's super cool. Um, which line is, um, is the same as the first one? One, two, or three? Are you sure? Why aren't you saying anything? Are you sure? It's funny how one person speaks and going, yeah, oh, he said it, it must be right. There must be a trick to this, right? Yeah? You're waiting to look to be stupid? Does anyone think it's not three first? Just to see if I can award a prize here. You don't, put your head down, I won't embarrass you. All right. Were well, you going to say it's not three? <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's three. Okay, we know it's three. Okay? But when you go to meetings, this happens. All right? This happens a lot. And this is a great experiment called the ASH experiment. They use it in psychology all the time. This is one of the most proven experiments over time. It only goes for a minute, so it's not going to kill us. This is done in a time where people wore, wore funny things and their hair was a little bit different. <laughs> so just, just roll with it. That was you guys a second ago. A lot of times when there are influencing factors, you know the answer. You, you look at that and you say, there's no way it's not three. But your brain starts to go, hang on, no one else is saying three. I use this sometimes at uni speaking when I um, say an answer and then people give me a response and I just pause. And then just that pause has some sort of power. I don't know what it is, but people start changing their minds. And it's just, it's just hilarious. But in groups, you see this all the time. In meetings, if, if the norm of the meeting, and this is why sometimes meetings are a bit ineffective, if especially powerful people within that meeting have a certain viewpoint, a lot of times we change our minds, we change our tendencies to, to meet that. Um, so that's the important thing about it. that's um, conformity. The last one I'll, I'll talk about is, is just, um, just a bit of a case study to get you thinking, to leave you um, with a bit of a puzzle. No right answer to this one. Um, it's not even a trick. Um, it's actually one of the issues I faced um, managing two very different individuals on one of my projects. So I thought I'd throw it out there. Um, I had one guy, let's call him Bob, um, the first guy, because his name was actually Bob. Um, and I had the next guy, let's call him Mike, because his name was actually Mike. So Bob was probably the most tardy person in, in, in my project team. Um, he dressed like me, didn't really have a suit or a tie or anything, and he came in very unpunctual. He got so much work done, I couldn't actually give him enough work. All right. Then we had Mike, who had been there for... I'm going to say 90 years because I think he'd been in that position for about 90 years. He did his job. He knew it back to front. But his performance was obviously been accepted for 90 years, so it was hard to change that. Um, but it was far less output than the other guy, Bob, who was coming in for you know, half the day. And if there was no work, he wouldn't even come in and say, can I work from home? I knew that just meant, can I just go to the beach and not do anything? How could you deal with this? There's no wrong answer here, yeah. So, no, I have got this. Cool. So, um, with the project, I think it's maybe a little bit too discretionary where you have such a little problem in general. Yeah. The work's been completed, um, whether by outputs by outputs by outputs. So, the work's been um, done, but you have a little bit. And your organisation would be sweet with that, HR would say? Um, yeah, I think so, in the project plan. Okay, that was one of my issues. I was fighting HR to say, He's got to be here for eight hours. You know? And with the second one, it's become the form of the penalty. Delivering the outcome any sort of like program is just a project manager. We use the criteria, sorry, we use the JLP or outputs. I was looking at outputs, but the organisation was, and, and quite rightly. Yeah. I was working for government at this point. <laughs> so 
so it was it was it was a really hard it was it was a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and that was the thing. I, I, I wanted to do that, um, and he was just, just smashing everything out. I was, actually felt, <laughs> I, I felt like a bad manager. I couldn't give this guy enough work. I was like, Dude. and this is interesting. If you want to have a research of something afterwards, um, it's called the psychological contract. Um, basically, it's, um, it's this principle that. Whilst we enter into a nego an, an employment contract with our employer, you get paid this, you get this. I'll just draw it very quickly. Um, the cycle contract is a, a bit of an unsaid thing where different parties make their expectations. So I'm going to go to work for you guys and I'm going to put in this much effort. Right? And in return, you're going to give me some sort of benefits, maybe cash, maybe car spot, whatever it is. Right? I start to build inside my head what I believe these benefits to be. For Bob, it was, hey, as long as I get my work done, I'm going to get this pay. All right? For Mike, it was, as long as I sit on that chair, I'm going to get my pay. So they had different psychological contracts. And this is how I sort of broke it down. One of the issues we had was, um, was Mike, because he'd base his psychological contract based on hours equals pay, whereas Bob based it on stuff I do, productivity or outcomes equals pay. There was a lot of tension between these two guys, as you can imagine. Right? So I had Mike, who was saying to me, look, I'm going to go and drop my performance because the other guy comes in, you know, four to six hours a day and does what he says was very little. Then I had Mike saying, look, I come in for this, that's fine, but I'm going to just slow down my work because I've got Bob, on the other hand, coming in for eight hours and doing... It was really tough, right? And the problem with the psychological contract is as humans, we like an equilibrium. So for me, I like to know that this is fair. And fair is what the employer said and I've agreed to. For me, that's fair. The problem is it's not a closed system. So we get influenced by what other people are doing. And this was largely the case here. Someone who thought this was fair, validated by all their co-workers doing the same thing, that's fair. Then you start throwing another variable in, and I'll use a red pen just because I want to make some colours and make it creative. You've got a guy over here doing a lot less. Initially, people will resist. They'll try and drive this person up and fight and arguments and so on. But if this person doesn't get performance managed well enough, what you can get is people start going down to the lowest acceptable level. Why am I doing this? Why am I putting all this effort to do this? This guy's equation is this much effort equals the same amount of pay. I'm going to drop my standards. And the worst thing is, the good people in your team won't drop their standards. They'll go and find another job. And then you're left with Muppets working at this level in your team. And, and that's, that's a real thing that can actually happen. And I, luckily, I did something about it um, to stop it happening. And I was really removing them from, from each other and giving them special projects. They didn't really know what each was doing. But it was like smoke and mirrors for a while. Even with joint ventures, I was working with Woodside and Transfield Services at the time on, on the um, Carratha gas plant, and someone's getting paid three times while the other one is doing the same job with a worse roster. And it's that psychological contract. It was fair when I signed up, but now I see this guy earning three times as much doing half what I'm doing. It's no longer fair. Your equation hasn't changed, but the variables have. So that's actually quite interesting consideration. So that's, that's pretty much all I was going to... Um, go through today. It's roughly okay for time, I think. Um, so... Good. That was, that was something that's like, make sure they're engaged, and I tried. <laughs> cool. Cheers.
lunchtime. <laughs>